Hi, I'm David Fraser. I'm an internet and privacy lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGinnis Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. In the last couple of weeks, there were reports that a government minister had settled with Ezra Levant regarding a court case that accused the minister of violating the complainant's charter rights for blocking him on Twitter. In a nutshell, Rebel News Network and Ezra Levant sued Stephen Guibault in 2021 because Stephen Guibault had blocked them both on Twitter. At the time, Stephen Guibault was the Minister of Canadian Heritage. The settlement says that he will unblock them and notably pay $20,000 in costs. Personally, I don't think much of any of the litigants in this case, but it is important and worth talking about. This has revived a bit of a conversation that's been going on for some time, not only about the propriety of politicians blocking citizens on social media, but also the legality. I am of the view, which is shared by many other lawyers, that blocking on social media by certain politicians is a violation of Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is not a new debate. In 2018, three residents of Ottawa sued the mayor of that city, alleging that his blocking of them violated the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Like the recent Guibault case, that was settled when the mayor agreed to unblock people. In 2019, an American federal court ruled that the then president could not lawfully block critics on social media. Now that, of course, was about the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. It's similar in some respects to our Canadian Charter, but not the same. So in this discussion, I'm going to talk about why it is unconstitutional for some politicians, but not all, to block people on social media, how the law works, and where the lines might be drawn. So the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms includes in Section 2B the right to freedom of expression. Probably the most important thing to understand, at least initially, is that the Charter only restrains government action. It does not regulate what you or I can do, but it sets limits on what the government can do. So if the government passes a law or implements a policy that says you can't say this or you can't say that, or you must say this or must say that, that would be an infringement of your right to freedom of expression. That infringement would then have to be justified as a reasonable limit prescribed by law that can be justified in a free and democratic society. Importantly, the right to freedom of expression not only includes your right to express yourself, but also includes a right to receive information. When it comes to receiving information communicating with a government or a government official, other democratic rights may also be implicated. So let's take a moment and think about what blocking on social media actually does. If somebody like Stephen Guibault blocks you from their Twitter or X account, it means that Guibault cannot see your postings. And he's probably pretty happy with that. More importantly, the person who has been blocked is not able to see Guibault's. The blocked person is not able to follow Guibault on that platform, at least through the blocked account, even though the postings could be public. They're not able to reply to Guibault's tweets because they cannot see them and are not able to participate in any discussion that may take place in the replies to those tweets. I think in the vast majority of cases, that is exactly what is the desired effect. If you block somebody on Twitter, you don't want to see their content and you don't want them to engage with your content either. Now that's fine if you're a private citizen. Ezra Levant can block anyone he wants, but Stephen Guibault cannot. So why are government departments and some politicians treated differently by the law? Quite simply, it's because they're government actors. A government department cannot pick and choose which citizens are able to receive news. Similarly, a government department is not able to, absent extraordinary circumstances, prevent somebody from receiving information or engaging with it. And that is exactly what a block on social media does. It is fundamentally undemocratic, a violation of the Charter, and very likely a safety hazard in an era when public agencies are relying on social media to disseminate critical safety-related information. The next important question that comes into play for individual politicians is whether or not they are government actors so that the Charter would apply to their conduct, and whether the social media account itself is used for public or governmental functions. Most members of Parliament, for example, would have Twitter accounts where they share information with their constituents. These are generally important channels for informing constituents who at least want to receive that information, but it's hard to say that a backbench parliamentarian is a government actor in the same way that a minister of the Crown would be. So if you look at the Twitter account of the politician in question, it's abundantly clear that that account is used for government businesses, conveying government policy and communicating with a whole range of stakeholders, including citizens. It's also used for partisan promotion and some personal use. But when the politician blocks anybody, they are effectively denying them access to that information. 
They're preventing the blocky from communicating with the politician, but also communicating with others in connection with the politician's announcements. In my view, this is a government action that limits the freedom of expression of the person who is blocked. In addition, I think it's also generally reprehensible. That said, I completely understand that some politicians and even some government departments may not want to have their social media feeds overwhelmed by cranks and trolls. Now, at least in Twitter, there's a mute function that will reduce that noise, but will not prevent others from obtaining news or engaging with the content. So in a nutshell, when a Twitter account is used by a government department or a government official to communicate government business to the public, blocking anybody from that account is prima facie violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This right is subject to the limitations in Section 1 of the Charter, but it's hard to imagine any circumstance where blocking a political critic could ever be justified. And just as a little aside, this is something that's bugged me for some time, many Canadian government social media accounts purport to have terms that they seem to think apply to citizens. Here's the Transport Canada Twitter account page, which includes a link to their purported terms. Now, as a preliminary matter, this has about the same legal effect as the disclaimers that you see at the bottom of email messages. It's meaningless. But if you take a look at the terms, it includes the following, quote, we will only take steps to remove or block subscribers if they do not abide by these terms of use. You know what? Those terms of use are meaningless. They have no effect on citizens of Canada and acting to block a citizen or resident of Canada would be a violation of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I hope this has been interesting and useful. I try to put out a new video each week or so. So if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about developments in Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.